I've done everything I can. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm like, why me? My hair's a mess and I look horrible. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. And today we are covering the case of Savannah Pascal. The clip that you saw at the beginning of this video was a man named Trent Pascal. And right after filming the full video, he allegedly killed his wife. Today, we're gonna watch that full video of him, the one that he posted to YouTube before it was deleted, as well as, of course, go over the whole story. For legal reasons, of course, I do have to say that this, the case against Trent is all technically alleged. He never made it to trial, and we'll get into that later. And even though there is pretty overwhelming evidence that he is responsible, he is still, since he never made it to trial, he was never convicted, and therefore, technically, all of this is not 100% proven. Before we jump into this story, I know that this video is probably gonna be at least mostly demonetized by YouTube, which is understandable. However, still gotta pay the bills, so a portion of this video is sponsored by Vessi. So we'll roll to that and I will start in just a minute. I'd like to take a very quick moment to thank today's amazing sponsor, which is Vessi. So something that you all probably don't know about me is that I actually, I hate rain boots. I hate them. I have never found a pair that A, I think looks actually cute on me, or B, are at all comfortable. I live in Washington state where it rains about nine months out of the year here, and so up until this point, rain boots have been a necessary evil. So I was really grateful that I found Bessie shoes. Now I can go on hikes and walks with my dog, not only in the rain, but also in the snow, mush, mud, trails, you name it, because Vessi shoes are 100% waterproof and snowproof. They are made from a material called Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit, so they keep your feet dry in the winter and cool in the summer. They are also sustainably made and made from all vegan materials. These are also just seriously my new favorite go-to shoes. Like, I'm not exaggerating. I wear them almost every day since I got them. They're really comfortable, and then not only that, but they actually just look really cute on me. Like they're actually stylish shoes that are also waterproof, which I just, I don't find that with other, with like rain boots and stuff. So I just, I love them. I love them. Check out Vessi shoes for yourself by using my link at the top of the description box below. That's Vessi.com slash Hannah the Horrible and use code HORRIBLE for $25 off your own pair of Vessi shoes. 48-year-old Trent Pascal lived in Lamarck, Texas with his 30-year-old wife, Savannah. They had two children, a 12-year-old son and an 8-year-old daughter. The 12-year-old son was not Trent's biological son. He was Savannah's biological son, but... So it was Trent's stepson and their daughter, the eight-year-old, was their child. Now, I do like to start stories with their relationship and the dynamics and kind of what we know about the family, but unfortunately, the info on this case is pretty scarce. We will get into some of those details, of course, but we just don't know everything. So this whole ordeal started on October 21st, 2020. Trent and Savannah had an argument that morning. Apparently it was a bad argument because Trent left the house afterwards. Savannah went to a neighbor's house and she had apparently asked the neighbor for help. So I don't know the details of their fight. I assume that Trent was showing some sort of scary behavior because I don't know why else Savannah would not only leave the house but go to her neighbors and ask for help. And then I believe she must have called her mother at that time as well because shortly after this her mother comes to the neighbor's house to meet Savannah. So this was a little while later that day. Savannah and her mom, Shirley, are together at this neighbor's house and they decide that they were gonna go back to Savannah's house together. What they were going to do, we will never know. I assume it was because Savannah didn't wanna be alone with Trent. That is speculation, of course. When they got back to their house, Trent was already there. He was waiting in the master bathroom behind the shower curtain. When Savannah and her mom got into the home, he popped out from behind the shower curtain where he was lying in wait and told both Savannah and her mom that he was going to shoot them. Surely, Savannah's mom was actually able to escape. 
she ran for it and was able to get away. She was able to go back, I believe, to the same neighbor's house and immediately call the police. Help, of course, arrived as quickly as possible. Savannah, however, did not get away. Trent shot her twice in the stomach. Her mother was able to get help there as quickly as possible, but unfortunately, Savannah passed away later in the hospital. Thankfully, both their children were at school at the time, so they were not witness to any of this. What also confused me is that if Shirley actually saw her daughter get shot, and I don't believe she did, from my understanding of all the reports, Shirley ran from the house the second she saw Trent, and as she was running, she heard gunshots behind her. So I don't think she actually witnessed the actual shooting, but of course she knew she needed help right away. Right before Trent carried this out, he made a four and a half minute YouTube video, which we will go over. It's absolutely astonishingly frustrating this video of his. We'll go over that in just a minute. I do want to take a quick note and say that I don't personally judge Shirley for running away when she saw Trent. And I just know that I'm going to get some comments about that. But I'm just from my perspective, I don't judge her because First of all, nobody has ever been in that exact situation that Shirley has ever been in. Even a similar situation is not exactly the same. You cannot know how you would react in that situation. Maybe she thought Savannah was right behind her. Maybe her flight instincts, maybe she just blacked out from fear and her flight instincts took over her body. Or maybe she instantly knew that both of them, including her daughter, would have a better chance if she got away and got help. If she had stayed, very likely Shirley would have lost her life as well. And then nobody would have been able to go on and tell Savannah's story and what happened to her. And for all we know, Trent could have gotten away with this. So I'm, I don't know what happened. I'm just saying try to reserve judgment if you've never been in that situation before and something that scary has happened to you. Okay, I really wanna take a portion of this video and deep dive this video that Trent posted, because I think, I mean, it is interesting, even though it's disgusting, it's interesting to look at a killer and see the type of behavior that they exhibit, especially when we know the type of person he is now. So if you look this up for yourself, you're gonna see a lot of sources say that Trent made this video shortly after the murders, but we have pretty good reason to believe that he actually recorded this while he was waiting for Savannah to come back and before he did this. I'll explain that in a little bit. And then of course, just a warning before we jump into the video, Obviously, I mean, you probably have deduced this by now, but it is disturbing. It is really creepy to watch. It's not graphic. Nothing happens in the video. You don't hear gunshots or anything like that. The ending is pretty disturbing right before he shuts off the camera, just from his behavior. There's no jump scares or anything like that. However, if you do prefer to skip this whole part of the video, feel free to skip ahead. Okay, let's talk about this video. Recording this because I want my daughter to know that I love you, Mackenzie. Pascal, I'm so sorry that I've done this. I want you to know that you mean everything to me. And William, I love you too. I love you so much. I love you like you're my own. This first part is just a clarification. Remember that the boy is his stepson and not his biological son, which seems to be why Trent is focusing so much on his eight-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, in the video and why he says he loves William like I love your mom. So just a clarification there. It doesn't really, it's not super important, but. I didn't choose this. Your mom chose this. Okay. The first what the fuck. This isn't the first time he's going to do this in this video, but he literally just straight up blames Savannah for her own death. I didn't choose this. Your mom chose this. I'm pretty sure she didn't choose it. She's been cheating on me for a long time. I have audio of her talking to other guys. I didn't do nothing wrong to her. When we first got together, I told her, you're too young for me. There's an 18 year old difference in her age. And I knew she was kind of too young, but I didn't 
she's been playing me for a full. I told her not to mess with me, not to mess with my emotions. Don't play with me. She, I got an audio where she was calling a guy yesterday on her way to get her eyelashes done. And she, she said, Hey baby. And I, and he goes, Hey, and I was like, that's not my voice. Why is she calling somebody else baby? Then she started talking about a dream and everything. And, and, and she had with them too about sex and everything. So as you just saw, he talks about their age gap. He talks about how he has reason to believe that Savannah is cheating on him and how he told her not to play him for a fool, essentially. Don't mess with me. Don't play with me. I don't see how that is some sort of kind thing that he thinks is a good thing to do as if that makes it her fault this is happening. That seems like a threat. To me, that sounds like he admitted to threatening her in the past. The other thing I want to mention is that I have no idea how he got the audio of her talking to another guy. I have a few guesses, but I couldn't find any information on that. I cannot imagine that it was anything short of controlling behavior. Now, the other thing I want to say here is that I don't care how many people she was cheating on you with. Even if Savannah was sleeping with a hundred other men, I do not understand why that means she deserves the death penalty and to be executed by her husband. I see this on, as a theme on a lot of true crime stories that involve affairs and it drives me absolutely bonkers that people literally blame the cheater on their for their death because they say they pushed the spouse. It's their fault. Maybe they shouldn't have cheated if they didn't want to get killed. I have literally seen that comment several times. It's very disturbing to me. While the crime of cheating is an awful betrayal and something terrible to do to somebody you love. Like, I'm not disputing that, but I don't think that the punishment for that equals the death penalty. You're literally deciding on behalf of the world that that person deserves to die because they did something that hurt you. I put everything into this relationship. I have done nothing to your mom. I've never hit her. I've never hurt her. I've never called her names. A couple of times when I got really mad, I would I would say a bad word or something. But I find this part probably the worst part of the video for me. How he says that I have never hurt your mother and I've never hit her. He's basically saying, therefore, since I've never actually abused your mom in the past, I don't know why this is happening to me. Poor me, I'm the victim here is what he's saying. Like, congratulations, buddy. You have managed to do the absolute bare minimum in a relationship by not hurting them physically. Like, congrats, what an angel. I don't, what the fuck? Also, I've never hurt her, but I am about to shoot her with a gun and kill her. But I've done everything I can. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm like, why me? So then he says, why me? Which is another just total playing the victim and I'm the victim here. She's gonna lose her life and I'm gonna be responsible for it, but it's not my fault. I'm the one that you should feel sorry for. I am not diagnosing because I am not a professional. I am not a mental health professional by any means, but to me, in my personal opinion, that aligns, that kind of victim mentality when you're a literal murderer definitely aligns with narcissism and psychopathy to me. It's again when that killer focuses on how hard this situation is for them. Why me? Poor me. My hair's a mess and I look horrible. Oh, sorry. Take these off. Another thing that's weird about this video is how he's worried about how he looks, fixing his glasses, he keeps fixing his hair, he apologizes for the way he looks in the video. And he's addressing this video clearly to his kids, especially his young daughter, who I believe was seven years old at the time. You'd think that a seven or eight year old girl who just found out not only is her mother dead, her father killed her, and her father is going to jail for a long time, I highly doubt that a seven or eight year old girl would care about what her dad looks like in the video. Again, it just seems consistent with certain self-absorbed personality traits to worry about your hair in that moment. I love you so much. Please do something good with your life. Please do something really good.
because you deserve a good life. And I don't know what else to say. I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry I don't have better words right now. <laughs> I'm hurting so bad. I'm, I don't know what else to do anymore. Oh my God, the fake crying. Like he's scrunching up his face and trying to sob, making the noises. But as many of you have probably noticed, there's absolutely no tears. His face is completely dry. I didn't do nothing wrong to her. I provided what I could. I've done what I could for her. I've done nothing but good for her. And I've treated y'all good. I've done good things for y'all. And I just... I don't know what else to say. I love you, Mackenzie. Most people that have to explain why they're a good person and go down the roster of all the great things about them and why they're a good person, those people usually aren't good people. How many wholesome, kind, genuine people do you know? Make sure that you know why they're genuine and wholesome and good person. This also gives me really abusive vibes, like you're the one that pushed me to do this. And mom, I love you. You've been the angel through my whole life taking care of me. You're there when I need you. You've always answered the phone for me. You've done everything. Sorry, I keep looking at the cameras. I don't know how much time I have. I've watched this video many a times by now and I was actually really confused by this part, but finally I thought he meant to say like, I keep looking at the clocks because he said I don't have much time, but I think he's looking at the cameras, the surveillance cameras around the house. So he's waiting for Savannah to come back. He's waiting to see her at the front door. And so that's why he keeps looking at the cameras because he needs to jump up and hide whenever she gets there. I've never done anything like, to her. I don't know, I'm so, I was going back. I, my mind is everywhere. I can't concentrate right now. I didn't, anyways, mom, I love you so much. You're my angel, I love you. You mean everything to me. And dad, you've done a lot for me too. And, and you've taken care of me, you raised me good. Um, you've done whatever you could. Thank you. I appreciate that. I love you so much. You, you love me like your own. So that ending, now you understand why this video is so disturbing. So he cuts off really suddenly in the mid, pretty much in the middle of his sentence. And he obviously saw on the cameras that Savannah had arrived home. So he quickly gets up and stops talking. He shuffles out of the room, forgetting to stop the camera right away. You hear something that sounds like a shower curtain opening. You can hear somebody like stepping into a hard surface. And then you very clearly hear on the recording, the shower curtain closing again. We know that he hid in the bathroom waiting for Savannah. And that's why we are pretty sure can't say 100%, but we are pretty sure that he shot this video while he was waiting for her, hid in the bathroom, and then shut off, finally remembered to shut off the camera before he carried this out. He made this video while he was waiting for her to come home. Okay, so that is the video. If you see other videos about this, that's usually what people talk about is this creepy video and then he kills his wife. This story actually does have a conclusion. Trent tried to flee the scene right after he did this and he was caught later that night in a Walmart parking lot just north of Houston. After being confronted by officers, Trent refused to drop his weapon and so officers were forced to shoot him non-fatally in the arm. He was then of course hospitalized, treated for his injuries before he was arrested. He was charged not only with murder, but aggravated assault, unlawful possession of a firearms, plus aggravated assault on a police officer for basically resisting arrest and threatening the police officers with a gun essentially. But Trent was released from jail on $550,000 bond. He had to wear an ankle bracelet as a condition of his release, 
but they still let him go out on bond. This confuses the heck out of me and maybe somebody in the comments can explain this to me because this is something I do not understand about the justice system or about, you know, our police systems. And to be fair, I'm not a judge. I don't know how it works. I don't pretend like I know how it works. But to me, a regular citizen, I really struggle to understand why somebody who is so clearly violent and suspected of murder was able to get out on bail at all. Not only that, but you'd think he'd be in big trouble for not only resisting arrest, but also like threatening the officers basically with a weapon. Like, I just cannot believe that they were just like, yeah, he should be fine. I don't, yeah, I don't get it. Anyway, so that was October of 2020. He is out of prison awaiting his trial. He is wearing an ankle monitor all the time, but on April 13th, 2021, about six months after this happened, Trent was able to get the monitor off. Authorities, for whatever reason, were not notified that his ankle bracelet uh, had been compromised. Authorities should get an alert if an ankle bracelet has been removed, a court-ordered ankle monitor has been removed from a defendant. Like, they would have been notified of that, and for whatever reason, they weren't. After he got the ankle bracelet off, it is believed that Trent then went to a car dealership in Houston. He pretended to be a customer and that he wanted to test drive a black Chevy Tahoe. However, when he was on the test drive with the car salesman, he then pulls a knife and threatens the salesman to get out of the car so that Trent could then steal the car. Jack Ford was the name of the salesman and he even said in a quote, he pulled out a knife and told me to get out of the car. I had weird vibes about the guy, like something wasn't right, but I didn't think he was going to steal a car. There is supposedly uh, surveillance footage of him at the dealership, but I couldn't find it. Unfortunately, I would have shown it in this video because I would have thought that was interesting, but I don't think it's available publicly. So now US Marshals are putting up wanted posters for Trent. And on the posters, of course, were the make and model of the car that he had stolen from the dealership. However, Trent was able to be on the run. He evaded law enforcement for the rest of 2021, like almost nine months. After the car theft, he was last sighted alive at his mother's home, leaving on a scooter, but that is the last time anybody saw him. Because of that, authorities believed that he was still hanging out in that area. However, they were wrong. He left shortly after that. On New Year's Eve of this year, so on New Year's Eve going into 2022, police finally received a tip from somebody. The tip came from Marion County, Florida, that Trent was spotted by a witness sleeping in a van at the Holiday Travel park in Ocala RV Park. Police rushed to the scene, of course. They were able to track down the vehicle that they believed Trent was in. They tried to make contact. They tried to communicate and ask him to please come out. But as the police were closing in on him and Trent knew that they were there, Trent refused to go to jail. Police officers heard a gunshot from within the vehicle. They were of course very careful before they went in. They weren't sure what they were gonna find, but they did indeed enter the vehicle and found Trent's lifeless body. He had of course died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He also had two weapons in the car with him and authorities do not know how he managed to get these. Now let's go back to the most important person of this story who is the victim, Savannah. Savannah's mother, Shirley, who we talked about earlier, who survived the attack even though she was there, said she was very grateful for the tip that somebody called into law enforcement, which ultimately led to them capturing Trent. She had said in a statement, did I want him to be held responsible for his actions? Did I want to look him in the eye and for him to face me again with what he had done? Yes. Am I sorry that he no longer walks on this earth? No. And then also, according to Savannah's mom, shortly before she was killed, she had told Trent that she couldn't live with somebody who was a habitual criminal and she wanted something better for their children. So apparently this was not the first crime that Trent had committed. The two children, whose names were Mackenzie and William, were of course tragically orphaned, but they had 
the happiest ending they could have for the awful situation. And Savannah's parents actually took them in and they are raising the children and they are in the process of trying to adopt them. I am glad the children are okay and didn't end up in foster care. And I think there was just immense relief on Savannah's parents' part because they said that they were just always looking over their shoulder when Trent was on the run for, you know, the better part of a year. They were always worried that he was going to come back for his children, for them, whatever. They were so scared that he was going to find them. And so even though they didn't get to face him at trial and testify against him like they wanted to, I think they are really relieved that he's gone. Savannah was a loving and very caring person. She was a devoted mother. She worked in the funeral industry, helping others with grief and loss. And at the time of her death, she was also working with Bay Area Turning Point, a nonprofit organization that helps victims of domestic violence. All right, everybody, that is going to be our story for today. Please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about the case like this video, not because the story's great, but just to help the channel out if you want to support me personally. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you, of course, so much to all my patrons. Special shout out to Top Tier's Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L., JJ, Dirty Kitty, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Whimsicott Fan, Delta Wolf 776, Mitchell Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul and Dark-Sided Otter.